Yes. Yes. I'm back again today and the celebration continues. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, we are still celebrating my mental health matters at six months. Day one, awesome. Day two, out of this world. Day three, you haven't seen anything like it yet because today I have with me a very powerful person and he's not just anybody talking about a topic just for the sake of it. He's been through the ups and downs through the valley and the mountain of substance misuse. And today he is a motivational speaker. He has been helping lives and, you know, just getting the message out there as the founder and CEO of the Message LLC. I have with me today, Frederick Chigot. Please welcome him with me if you're on watching us. Thank you very much for honoring my invitation and for being absolutely. here with us today, Frederick. Yes, absolutely. Bless you. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. So, I mean, you're still going to tell us more about yourself, but mm -hmm. I want to just dive right into today's topic. Okay. Which is addiction is bondage. There's no other way to say it. And yeah. I want us to start from this point of how did addiction ruin your life? How? I think um, we should start from there. All right. Well, first of all, um, I want to give honor to God and thank you for having me. I'm very humbled and thankful to be here. It's a real blessing. Um, first, and second of all, thank you all for being here, for uh, sharing your time. Uh, so, yes, how did addiction ruin my life? Simple. Um, it led me to eating out of dumpsters. It led me to panhandling. It led me to homelessness. It led me to sleeping next to dumpsters. It led me to sleeping on park benches. It took away happiness, joy, peace, faith. Um, it took away education. It took away family. It took away parenting. It took away all the goodness of life. It put me in the worst, lowest, darkest place I've ever been in my life. Well, that's a really low point. And that's, yeah. uh, that's a really big. So knowing all this terrible things that addiction brought upon you, mm -hmm. Can we go back to what your childhood was like? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good question. Um, I think one, it's not asked enough. A lot, uh, the, there's the societal thinking about substance abuse is that you just pick up. But what is not known is, is that there is a process. There's a procedure to how this normally works. Uh, if you talk to most people that have been sober for any amount of time, they'll tell you that there was behaviors that presented early. In my case, the first thing that I ever abused was my asthma in. I'll never forget it. My mom came home. I had asthma. Um, she was really, we were really blessed because she had really good insurance. And the insurance she had gave her access to Ventolin and Vanceril. It's a medication. It's a steroid. And I'll never forget, it was the blue bag. Um, I'm, I'm a little old and date myself. So we took the bag and I had to inhale it. And I'll never forget the euphoric feeling I got from that steroid. And at that moment, at nine years old, I knew I was going to get high off that steroid. At nine, I couldn't wait for her to leave the room. As soon as she left the room, I'm abusing it. Months follow that, my medication is running lower than she, she can't, she don't know what's going on. She's asking the doctor, she can't understand. I end up falling down the steps, had to get stitches because I was so high. Um, what else happened? I remember like the first time I tried pepperoni, I liked it so much, I ate so much, I threw up. Um, I remember like eating a box of blow pops and I broke out. Um, even now let's fast forward, right? I've been sober now by God's grace for four, over four years. I ate so much ice cream, my cholesterol shot up. I, I bought so many candles. I got like 50 candles in my house. Every time I hit something up in a microwave, if the directions say a minute, I'll go to three minutes. I'll boil stuff over. Like my, it's, it's a brain disease. That's why I always tell people it's not a disgrace. It's a disease. It's my a disease. brain, my brain is built on more. I don't have an off switch to enough. Um, so those behaviors presented early at nine years old and then with untreated addiction. And then you add on depression, you add on anxiety, uh, which are mental health conditions that I had that I wasn't addressing. You combine that with addiction, then you get to things like alcohol and drugs. 
and drug. So, so uh, now talking about your childhood and all mm. those things that you were doing, mm. um, were there ways you could have been helped, or is, was this because of your your socioeconomic uh, condition or the way your home was? Were you from, uh, you know, a, a dysfunctional home, or was right. it any? like that in your childhood or were you abused or did anything like that happen to you that could have contributed to to this behaviors yeah that's a very good question um trauma always plays a part right um all of us come from different backgrounds and all the rooms of recovery that i've ever been in it's people from all over the world all types of um illness it doesn't discri discriminate for me um i always tell my mom i never felt well i never felt whatever normal was i never felt that um, definitely was bullied in school. Definitely. Um, definitely. I, I was, I was blessed growing up because I, I had a mother that got sober when I was in third grade. She went to treatment one time for five days and she never relapsed by God's grace. She just celebrated 26 years. So I grew up in the rooms. And on top of that, uh, my grandfather was retired and my parents had split early. So my granddad, bless him, stepped in, God bless his soul. He stepped in and raised me. So I came from a Christian you know, healthy home that was no drugs and alcohol. But that's why it's so important for people to understand. You can come from that and still end up using drugs and alcohol if you don't treat your own issues. Just because I come from a home that doesn't have that has no bearing on the decisions that I'm going to make. If I'm not willing to put the work in, if I'm not willing to accept that this is what I have, no matter where I come from, this is what I'm going to get. So yes, untreated mental health, um, being bullied, not feeling good enough, low self-esteem. You add all those things in together, it's a perfect storm for addiction. So, okay, so you, you mentioned very crucial points that I don't want mm -hmm. us to just go go through Absolutely. without talking about. So okay. you, low self-esteem, bullying, mm -hmm. um, you know, not feeling good about yourself. Did you share mm -hmm. this thing with anyone and nobody listened or did you reach out for help relating it what to mental health care? Okay, so one of the things that looking back that I should have did, but I didn't, is I didn't reach out for help. You know, we live in a society where stigma outweighs education. Thanks. It takes courage to reach out and ask for help. It takes courage to know what's going to come with that. I have a, a sense of fear. I don't want to deal with the rejection. I don't want to tell my friends or, or especially at a, at, a, at a young age, right, did not have the intestinal fortitude to deal with what comes with that. I don't want to tell kids or tell somebody, hey, I don't I don't feel right. Right. Like, I don't want to deal with that, because once you one thing I learned is once you open your life up, you deal with whatever comes, you become vulnerable. And I didn't feel comfortable enough. And especially, you know, I got to say in my family, God bless them. But I just know in my family, when you sit down at Sunday dinner to come out and say, hey, I have a mental health diagnosis and I have an addiction especially as a man, it, it just, no, because we live in a society where men aren't supposed to cry. Even though we have tear ducts, even though we're human beings, we live in a society where if you're a man, you're not supposed to show emotion. And I just don't think that I was in a situation where that could have been handled in a proper way. Because in order to bring those issues out, there has to be proper authorities that can deal with that. Even my mother who was sober, living a wonderful life, she felt shame and about talking about her issues because she didn't want to deal with came with that. You, you, thanks for sharing that because Absolutely. I mean, it's so important the shame, the stigma, the fear, you know, Absolutely. the rejection, the loneliness, the, Absolutely. you know, you just feel isolated, like something is wrong with you. And, right. uh, it's it's good that you are now you understand that thing and i believe is some of the things you you tell people uh not to do so that they can help themselves absolutely so, knowing all those things and where you are now tell us about the turning point and the steps your steps to recovery i think i can wait to hear that oh yeah um you know i always tell people there's two sides of this game right um so the the turning point was i was downtown homeless I'm a Western Pennsylvania kid, uh, but I now live in Philadelphia. And I was downtown homeless, out of my mind, and a wonderful African-American man woke me up. And I was, I, I told him, I said, let me die. Let me go. He said, no, you're not dying today. And he Is called an ambulance. Yo, absolutely. That's suicidal ideation. I wouldn't die. I was done. I gave up on life. 
I told the guy, I said, let me alone. I failed as a human being. I failed as a parent. I'm a horrible person. Let me die. And he said, no, you're not dying today. And he saved my life. He called the ambulance. The ambulance got me and I entered treatment. When I entered treatment, and this is crucial, we're going to get into this later. I was the most humbled in my life. And I want you to understand this. I was in the basement of a treatment facility and I was going through the underwear and I was picking out the ones that weren't stained. I want you to understand that I had to get so humble. I had to get to such a low bottom and, and all of our bottoms are different. We're all different, but I had to get to a bottom like that in order for me to understand what I was up against. Now, mind you, I had been to 20 treatment centers. Mind you, I had been in recovery houses. Mind you, I had been in shelters, but there was something about that situation. And I'd spent 78 days in that treatment. And what I learned in there is don't count the days, make the days count. And I started every night digging into books, doing journaling, talking to counselors. I started a prayer group while I was in there. It started with three people. By the time I left, there was 34 people, staff included. Once I left treatment, I took a year of getting my mind and, and social, like just everything right, my emotional. I got connected with a church. I got my spiritual life right. I got my emotional life right. I got my network right. I had uh, been blessed to find my wife. I entered college and I never looked back. Great, great. So let's assume I have issues with addiction now or with uh. any kind of substance misused and I'm telling you I want to seek help what are the steps because you're talking about treatment center people do not want to be like we're talking of rejection nobody wants to go to the rehab it's like right. a shame people don't want to be known going to the rehab or doing stuff so what would you tell me coming to you to say I want to help myself out out of this mess what are the steps I should take all right first thing I would tell you is one thing I learned is to become a master, you have to study other masters. So I would seek out other people that have been where you are and have now changed their life. That's the first thing I would do. Second thing I would do is, well, actually, the first thing I would do is whatever spiritual and prayer life you believe in, whatever that may be, universe, God, any whatever you believe that is stronger than yourself, seek that first. The second thing I would do is I would find other people that have gone through what you've gone through, right? Right. The third thing I would do is I, I would ask that person, look at it like this. If you had cancer, if you had diabetes, if you had a terminal illness and you needed help, would you seek it? 99.9% .9 of the time, the person is going to say yes. So I'm going to ask them, what's the difference with this? Because at the end of the day, this is a terminal illness, just like anything else, but it can be arrested. So you need to look at this in the same way you would look at a physical illness, because that's the only way you're going to get, get help. You ever notice a cancer patient, regardless of what shame what's coming with it, regardless of how bad it's going to look, they go get help because right, they understand right. that if they don't, what's coming with that? We got to have the same mentality about mental illness and substance abuse because at the end of the day, who's ever going to shame you for getting help? You don't need to be around them anyway. If somebody's going to down you or, or look down on you or laugh at you or not look at you as a normal, equal human being because you wouldn't sought help, then you need to step away from them anyway. What if you don't get your family support? Um, welcome to life. And I always say uh, love is uh, blood isn't loyalty. The most important people in my life now, 90, 99% of them are not blood. I have a whole new family and they are all filled with all diverse people of all backgrounds and none of them are blood. Family is who the people in my belief system, family is who the people God put in your life and that show that they're family. Sometimes and what I've learned is you have to get away from your biological family in order for your life to thrive. Because what I've seen so many times is people will allow loyalty to hold them back from being able to achieve their dreams. Fam just because you're by my side does not mean you're on my side. People need to understand. Just because you're family doesn't mean you're healthy. I can love you from a distance. Powerful. Thank you. And, and, and real quick, why sacrifice your happiness for the happiness of someone else? Never do that. Never do that. So now we've been able to establish, like you told us, that addiction is a disease. It is a yes. brain disease that needs treatment. And Absolutely. just like 
seek treatment for any physical illness is the same way we should seek treatment for addiction, which you just told us it is a terminal disease, right? Absolutely, but it can be arrested. It's terminal. There's no change in it, but it can be arrested, meaning you can live a healthy, full life without abusing drugs or alcohol or any other substance. Right. Great. So now I want to tell us, if parents out there, there's so many parents dealing with their children or, yes. you know, with their little ones dealing with having addiction or substance misuse issue. What would yes. you tell parents? What's the message you, you have for parents today? Well, this is a beautiful, wonderful question and one that I am so thrilled to answer. If I am a parent of a person with substance use or mental illness, hear me and hear me well. Get used to consequence. It's not going to feel normal. OK, let me explain. My mother had to put me out, had to call the police. My mother understood. And I don't know if it's because she worked in the treatment field. I don't know if this is because the way she's built. You're going to have to do things that are that are unnatural because with addiction and mental illness, it takes consequence in order for a person to stop. I always say it like this. Who stops robbing banks if they never get caught? OK, you have to be willing to consequence. That might look like your kid ended up in jail because they wouldn't stop using. So you can't send you can't send money to the jail. You can't go get them out. You may need to put them out. They may need to sleep on a park bench. They may need to be homeless. They may need to suffer a severe consequence because if not, why are they going to stop? If I know that when I stop, I'm always going to have bailout, what would stop me from doing that? That's why I always say all the time, in order to be a successful parent with a person with substance use and mental illness, you got to be tough love. That's what I've seen work. And I, look, I speak at treatment centers once a month. I just spoke to literally over the time of speaking to addicts of thousands and thousands of people, like literally, trust me on this. 99% of them people say the same things. My parents yeah. enable. My parents allow me to come back home. My parents this. The more you enable, you're just leading them to their casket. I'm being as honest as possible. Thank you. Thank you yep. for letting us know that. But it, let's do this. What about parents, you know, in at the early stage, what can right. parents do to help children not continue to build up that? Because, you know, we can talk about those who already have the issue, but what right. about, you know, the uh, kids, those with those of us with young children and stuff? What would you say that if you notice the thing, try to intervene this way? Right. So pay attention to the behaviors, right? Like, I, and I want to make this clear. There seems to be a societal book on parenting, like a, a certain atmosphere of thinking, you got to throw that out when you have a person with substance use and mental illness. And the reason being is it's going to be different parenting. Now. So I would say this, pay attention to behaviors. Okay. Like you might say, oh, my kid played so many video games. He fell asleep with the video game on and the video game's hot. Look at that. Look at patterns. If you keep finding ice cream under your kid's bed every single day and he's eating to the point where he gets sick, you need to look at that. Look at behaviors. Look at things that they're doing to see why they're doing it. Talk to them. Monitor their social media. I can't tell you how many schools I've spoke at and the kids have free access to whatever they want on social media. That, that'll tell you a lot. Who are their friends? Who are they hanging with? Another thing is, if they're getting really good grades and they drop off, something's wrong. Pay attention to what they're wearing. A lot of parents don't pay attention to how the kids start dressing. Signs of depression are things like this, a lot of sleep, a lot of isolation, right? Not keeping up on her hygiene, letting her weight uh, fluctuate all the time, uh, eating bad, not being vibrant, not having a network of friends, not you as a parent, you can see the spirit within your child. If you see that start to dissipate, if you see those things start to change, if you see certain behaviors that become over, Start seeking advice. Start seeking help. There's nothing wrong with it. Because if you can catch it early, you're going to save yeah, yourself yeah. a lot of pain. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, yeah, let's, we talk to parents. Let's talk about spouses. You have a yes. spouse going yes. through uh, addiction or a substance misuse issue or even, you know, addiction to any other things, to sex, to gambling, to pornography, to so many things that 
couples are dealing with, what would you mm -hmm. tell the spouse of somebody that is going through this issue? Because it brings a lot of pain into the family, brings a lot of, you know, uh, instability into the relationship and even affects the children. So what, how can spouses help? Two parts to this. One, what I've learned is if I'm in a home where I'm, where I have an, a, a, an addiction that is creating chaos in that home, it's not just me that's unhealthy. The whole home is unhealthy. Meaning yeah, like yeah. If, if you're with a person to where you're abusing anything or you, you have a, order, a disorder that's causing destruction in your home, they need to heal and they need help also. That's number one. They need therapy. They need counseling also. The second thing is they need a network of people and, and, and they need to look in the spirit in other groups where those people deal with the same type of homes as well. Because what's going to happen is, and I say this, when the person gets sober or when they get clean from what they're dealing with, there's going to be a change. And I've seen so many times when a person changes and when they get healthier, they end up leaving the person they're with because they now realize they aren't healthy either. So I would say family therapy, family counseling. Um, I would also say, which is real key, if you know your spouse has an issue, you need to study that issue as much as possible. So you better be reading books about addiction. You better be looking up books about addiction. You better be studying conferences. You be Treat it like you would if you just found out they got Parkinson's. Treat it like you would if you just found out they got diabetes. Treat it like you would if you just found out they got kidney failure. That's how you got to look at it. Just if you do five mile runs, if they had cancer, if you donate, if you if, if you do that type of stuff for another illness, can treat it like this. Because when you show the same care and the same heart that they had cancer, have an addiction, I'm sure you'll get better. Great, great. If you have a spouse going through, you know, having addiction issues, do everything you will do as if you found out they had any other issues. Right. Learn, read, research. Simple. Don't give up on them. No, no. But I will say this, though. Be healthy. Meaning, like, understand if you're with somebody with that type of disorder and you've been with them while they're in that for a substantial amount of time, then you need to look in the mirror because there are things about you that are unhealthy that you need to work on. A lot of people don't want to hear that, but that's true. Most healthy people are not attracted to unhealthy people. I agree with you. Now, let's talk to teenagers. Yes. I, I ask people to come and let their teenage children sure. watch this just for, to know, not because they, they have, you know, they're addicted to anything or something going on, but I just think the more people that know and understand these things, they're able to help other people. And if we have someone that's actually going through that, you know, addiction issues right now and they're listening, what would you tell them? Go to those who do not have any issues and to somebody that might actually be uh, going through addiction problems right now, teenagers or children. Let me say this. When I was a kid, uh -huh. I used to think that my life got better because I got a better house, I got more money, I got a better looking girlfriend, and I got better materialistic things. Hear me and hear me well. My life got better because I became a better person. One of the reasons I started this company is because I do not want teenagers to make the same mistakes I made. This is coming from years of regret and years of failure and years of pain that I don't want another kid to go through. If you have a addictive, if you're going through addiction right now, if you don't feel well, ask for help. It will save you years of pain that you do not want to go through. I don't want nobody else, my worst enemy, to ever have to eat out of a dumpster. I don't want anybody else to ever be homeless. I don't want anybody else to have to go through this. But I promise you, because I didn't look at this stuff early, because I refused to deal with this early, it led me down the darkest path of my life, which is pain that I still deal with. I still see a therapist for stuff that happened in my past. I still go through stuff. Just yesterday, I was talking to my wife and I was crying about some stuff that had happened. That's what's going to come with this. There's going to be wreckage. There's going to be pain if you do not deal with it. So, so right now, stop and think, what is most important? My health or the material or the accolades or all that other stuff 
it ain't going to matter at the end of the day. If you have health, you have wealth, period. If you have health, you have wealth, period. Yep. Period. And that, that uh, information is not just for teenagers, even for me, for you, for anyone that might be watching us here. And that's that's really powerful. So can, do you have can add, any... Can I add this in real quick? Yes, please. So now, you know, in high school, right, there's this list of uh, who's the most likely to succeed, right? And it's criminal that they even do that. Trust me on this. The kids that were laughed at, the kids that were not going for the attention, the kids that were focused on being healthy and, and focused on their grades and not using drugs and alcohol. Now that the smoke has cleared, they are the ones that ended up with the most beautiful lives. They are the ones that ended up in good situation. It wasn't the kids that got high. It wasn't the kids that were drinking. It wasn't the kids that were hanging out trying to be cool. The kids that were focused young and understanding those things weren't good for them, they are the ones that ended up well. So if you're a teenager, hear that. It's not about the most praise. It's not about the most hype. It's not about the most light. It's about who is the healthiest. Great, great. And you know, as we're talking about, you know, we're talking about parents, spouses, teenagers, I think we should address schools as well. How can the school system, the educational system help these teenagers? What are the things that, you know, they can do? For one, I would say they need to bring people like you more to talk to teenagers and to churches and to religious houses and stuff so that they can hear this message and really, because I think someone like you will connect better with this children with the teenagers that you know a professional psychiatrist or something just coming i mean it, we can help but right. hearing powerful message the story of someone that actually went through it i think is more impactful how can schools help um this is why i do what i do um because number one they need first of first the first thing they need to do is they need to allocate funding to health programs meaning they need to start thinking and they need to start realizing we're in the worst epidemic this country has ever seen. We get the whole student. We don't just get parts of them. We get exactly everything that comes with them. So whatever their home life is, they're bringing that through the door. So we need to be able to set them up with success by having a support system that will allow us to get the best fruits out of them. Meaning we need to have counseling and therapy on, 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 on site. Meaning we need to have, you know, a program and a support system to where if this kid has an issue, he's not going to feel shame. He's not going to feel stigma because he's going to know if I go down the hall to building B, there's going to be a network of people that are willing and eager to help me. We need to make sure in HR, when we're bringing people in this building, that we're bringing people in here that understand these issues and understand the type of diverse populations we're getting in here so that when they have students that have a heroin problem, when they have students that have a mental illness problem, they're not just writing them off or they're not just not understanding how to deal with them. We're bringing the right people in the building so that when these issues present, they're able to deal. It starts from the top up, from the top of the people, and that trickles down all the way to the janitor. Having an atmosphere of inclusivity, having an atmosphere where we accept you for who you are, we want you for who you are, and we understand that if we have a healthy student, we're going to have an A student. That's how they can help. And on top of that, bring people in with lived experience that these kids can relate to. Because one thing I've learned, is it great to have a PhD? Yes, I want one. Is it great to have education and certifications? Yes, I want one. But you know what's also great that money can't buy? Experience. And that's what kids will relate to and that's what they will respect. Powerful. Thank you. And yes. our, you know, for our audience and all every part of the world, I think that we should just be intentional about bringing health stuff to school. And yes. we should be intentional about bringing people that can talk to the children. And it's not all about academics. And I think one of the issues we're having is the, you know, the emphasis that we have on education and you have to have A's and B's that that's putting a lot of pressure even on children that so when they fail or when they don't meet the parents expectations or when they don't fit into that uh, category of A students, it puts so much pressure on them that, you know, now they are feeling the need to make up 
with something else that you know to to or to escape from that shame or to be able to meet the demands of the society and of the of of their parents and uh, I, so what from what you said, I think the parents can help, the school system, education system can help, and as individuals, the teenagers and the children should also be eager to help themselves, and they should keep. Mm -hmm. To your point, um, and they're valid. I just I don't want to forget this. I want people to understand this. Robin Williams, Kate Spade, and Anthony Bourdain, all wonderful, blessed human beings that literally changed the fabric of the institutions that they serve, legendary. They're all gone, unfortunately, due to mental health. So let that be an example of it doesn't matter how accoladed you are. It doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter the achievements and the rewards you've received in life. If you're not taking care of your health and your mental health is not right, it's over. So I, I want people to understand that it's that critical. Riches Addiction and mental illness doesn't discriminate. It seeps into every part of society. So understand that. That's great. That's great. It, it doesn't discriminate. Wow. No. Yeah. Um, okay. So tell me, how can people find you? What do you do? Tell, tell, I think you should tell us more about what you do and right. tell us how people can find you. Um, so I'm blessed to wear three hats. What I do is what my first hat is. Um, I'm an honor student at Westchester University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'll be finishing out my bachelor's degree. And I'm in my junior year. I'll be finishing out my bachelor's degree in two years. I'm in the honors college. Very thankful for that. The second hat that I wear is I have a motivational speaking company called The Message LLC. And through that company, I literally travel the country and I speak on mental health and substance abuse along with sharing my story. Um, I was very blessed to be a national keynote at the NASHI conference, which is National Association of Homeless Education. That was my latest event. I just spoke at California uh, Collegiate Recovery. I did a workshop there. I do a keynote called What Is Your Legacy? I have a website. It's uh, www.themessagellc.com. And what I do is I uplift student bodies. I inspire, I educate, and I create healthy lifestyles for all because I've made it a mission that I want other people to thrive and not just survive. And I made it a mission that I don't want to see anybody else ever go through the pain I went through. And I wanna educate the world because for some reason, we live in a society where stigma outweighs education. For some reason, John Hopkins, Yale, Princeton, Harvard, we've been studying the brain since the early 1900s. And instead of believing that material, we will believe what we wanna believe over published, articles, over studies, over scientists that have worked literally in labs with rats. Like for some reason, we just won't believe that. So I made it a personal mission to travel this country and to tell kids in high school, colleges, and conferences, hey, this is real. Is it, are you only in the United States? Are you keep saying this country. What about the world? Yeah. What if oh, no, you want yeah. to that, I, yeah, or somewhere? Yes, true story, right? Um, so Stawa University in Nigeria before COVID, they actually had offered me to come over there and speak to their student body. And we were talking that if they liked my programming, they were actually going to implement it in their school system. And, and then COVID hit and it just it didn't it didn't function. But yeah, my company's open for business. I'll go to Antarctica if need be. Wherever I'm needed, I'll go. <laughs> awesome. Good. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for making your, for, for turning your story around to make it a, a tool that others can use to rise up, uh, for using your story to inspire people. Thank you for not just keeping this wealth of information to yourself. Thank you for wanting to use your energy, you know, to also, to, to infect other kids, let's put it that way, so that they're able to live their best life and not just let addiction put them in that bondage forever. Uh, I can't thank you enough for honoring my invitation. Um, my Mental Health Matters is six months and there are people from all over the world <laughs> in, in the group. And you know, I will encourage people, please join the group. You keep, we keep bringing people that can talk to us, you know, about mental health, the way that we can understand it so that we know that this is not something in the book or something that uh, one professional person is just talking about. Mental health issues affect people's lives. 
yes. human beings like you and I and Frederick. And the, the more we know, the empowered, the more empowered we'll be to make the right decisions for ourselves. And for those of us that might be in any depth, any valley of mental health issues or mental illness, there's a way out. Please ask for help. Please just reach out to somebody. You are not alone and you can ask for help. People are dying uh, as a result of addiction, uh, mis substance misuse, overdose, and lives have been wasted, futures have been destroyed because of, of substance misuse all over the world. And we can do something because everybody's life is valuable. Your life is valuable. Nobody is less than anyone. Actually, I want you to tell us that your favorite quote. Oh, favorite yeah. Quote. Mm -hmm. So my favorite quote is, I look up to the people others look down on. It's a Chinese bra Chinese proverb. Um, and I want to thank you for what you do. History will shine bright on you. Since COVID, overdose rates and suicides have gone up. Thank you for what you're doing. You are literally helping to save lives and you're a blessing to the earth. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, everyone who watches. Please, um, if you have any questions, drop it. Frederick will be responding. And I will put Frederick's uh, information and contact information there if you want to reach out to him. Please feel free to reach out to him. If you cannot reach out to him, reach out to me and I will hunt him down for you. Right, and right. <laughs> I will hunt him down for you and get him to answer your question or respond to what you want. Thanks yes. again for being here. Yeah, and thank you. You're welcome. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. And tomorrow we're talking about trauma and divorce, the impact of divorce. So please stay on mm. with us. Uh, we're, we're doing this thing, getting knowledge till Friday. Okay, thank All you. Right. Bye. You're welcome. Have a blessed day.